wind up. <laughs> All one could say is you can do anything you like with statistics. I always remember when that ridiculous piece from the Times came out about being the 50th and most something, something, something influential, whatnot. I've got two daughters, and as we all know in this room, it's your children that keep your feet very firmly on the ground. And uh, one is called Charity Louisa Horatia, because her father was obsessed with Nelson. Uh, <laughs> and the other is called Victoria Alwyn Hope, which is an important leadership message, because without hope, the situation is hopeless. Anyway, they roared after the idea that I was the 50 most influential woman in Britain, and they took a particularly dreadful picture of me in a pair of old gardening trousers, stuck it up on the fridge, and said, has anybody any concept underneath it how appalling it is to actually have to live with one of the 50 women? <laughs> so I'm very proud of that lovely entry, but the honour and the pleasure and the delight uh, is all mine to be invited here tonight uh, to gather together all those who share some common history, some common heritage to reconvene for an evening uh, and reflect on what we share, what we've learned, and what we can do. So like the DVD, rewind, where have we come from? Pause, where are we now? Fast forward, where are we going? And what could we achieve together as an incredible alumni of one of the most impressive schools uh, in Britain. And I'm humbled to be invited to follow in the footsteps of proper bronze brokers, as David Arkin said to me the other day, that I was very lucky to be in on this particular game. Um, <laughs> though I gather Lord Hesseltine's footsteps didn't settle very long in the mud of mid Wales. Uh, and I think it wasn't there all that much time. But anyway, I'm sure he made a great line of it. And I know uh, David a bit from his work with O2 and 7 Trent when I was uh, chief executive of business and community for probably rather too long, nearly 20 years. And the other great passionate ambassador, of course, of Bronze Grove has is that uh, great Duracell bunny, one uh, Digby Jones, uh, <laughs> with the exuberance, energy, can do, determination, absolutely incredible. Uh, example of uh, the way in which Ron's Grovians uh, make an impact in the wider world on society. So first, it's lovely to be here to applaud and support the idea of the Foundation Lecture. I wish that more uh, great tribes did this because it's really important, I believe, to recharge the batteries, to understand what well we drank from and what it is we're now all doing and could do more together. Uh, secondly, of course, however, the Bronze Grovian who actually invited me to do the Foundation Lecture, I would crawl across the Sahara for if he asked me to. It would be painful. But my uh, admiration for Stuart Toe is absolutely unbounded. And I speak from one who's seen a fantastic number of business leaders evince tremendous commitment to the cause of getting their businesses more engaged in their communities or leaders who say it would be really nice to do this. But somehow the road to heaven is paved with convenient parking spaces and it never quite happens always as you hope it might. And the mating call of the Porsche is very compelling at times. But this is a man who I have watched and observed and listened to and learned from. And he carries the values and the vision, which I believe are the key values and the key vision for those who run businesses in the UK. And I suppose that's partly why we've got a lot of rather untidy tents outside St Paul's at the moment. It's because actually not enough leaders have seen the point that Stuart has seen. So I wanted to try to bottle that a bit this evening and to reflect, rewind, pause and fast forward about what Bronze Grovians do to make the difference in wider society. And I'll talk a little bit more about the work of Stuart as well. The point, I suppose, 
And I remember this always so clearly, listening to John Brown and BP in the days before it was fashionable to really hate John Brown. Uh, and actually John Brown was a great man in his early vision for where BP would be. <coughs> and I remember inviting a group of business leaders to come to the British Museum to listen to John, to talk about three things he said he'd like to talk about. First, he'd like to talk about Venice. Then he would like to talk about 18th century Venetian prints. And thirdly, he would like to talk about his study of the, how his study of the first two subjects had helped him in his leadership of the third. And everybody thought, what on earth is this lecture going to be about? And John began to talk enormously knowledgeably about Venice. And the key question to ask about Venice, he said, was what on earth had actually happened in Venice in that late 17th, early 18th period? What was going on? There was that great trading nation who'd been pushing the boundaries across the world for years, <coughs> known for their trading, their determination, their courage, their bravery, their determination to dominate Western trade routes, when suddenly they sank back on their haunches, they became an Adriatic theme park, they began to live on their rents, they lost the plot. And he said that his whole life had been studying what had happened to Venice, what was going on in Venetian 18th century prints, and what was relevant to him in his running of BP as he came to take on as the leader in 1990 or so. And he said, actually, when you look at it, exactly the same thing that happened to BP as it happened to Venice. They'd stopped saying, what's the news on the Rialto? What's going on out there? What's happening? What's changing in society? What's different? The head has just mentioned those schools who believe that they can be the castle on the hill and in some extraordinary way remain hermetically sealed from how Britain is changing. I can't think of a greater or more important thing to do for young people of today than to live in a community with 40 different languages. Britain is an amazingly successful diverse world pool. and that's what society is about and that's what John Brown meant because the businesses like the schools who fail to take account of what is going on in the wider world become as BP had become completely inward looking only concerned with the politics of life in that place not concerned with how we actually achieve and reach our customers and make the difference. So if the whole future competitiveness of the UK actually depends on our ability to unlock the talent, to release the ability, to raise the aspiration, to get the achievement that we need for our long-term future. At this moment, 1% of all physics graduates in Britain come from one grammar school in Kent. Last year, there was not one single child in the London borough of Islington who passed physics A-level in one secondary school in the whole of Islington. And yet we are entirely dependent, actually, on the quality of talent that comes through into manufacturing, into science, into technology, into engineering, into all the things that will help Britain to trade its way in the world. And that's why it's such an exciting opportunity to come and talk to this great tribe of Bromsgrovians about what is going on in education and our relationship to it. Because 
you can say that if you look at what marvelous notes I've been sent uh, about people talking on what Bronze Grove means to you, means to me, you see some brilliant quotes and snapshots of if you were trying to bottle up Bronze Grove, what is it that you've managed to achieve together in this school, which is what we manage to achieve, must manage to try to achieve in other schools? Roy Hughes talks that for him, Bronze Grove is about loyalty, courage, and resilience. And as I wear my poppy and think of my darling husband, who died 13 years ago now, who at the age of 21, set out in a British fishing boat which floated out of the Cornish River and Helford River over to Tresco, repainted into French colours, made out as a French fishing boat, floated out into the Camaray Sound where they waited as one senior officer, one junior officer, one John Garnet, age 21, just out of rugby, done one year up at Cambridge, then into the war. And the rest of them, a few sailors, one who could speak French, everybody else, John's French was at the level of Ua Le Trump or Calais, <laughs> wouldn't have lasted a moment, I suspect. And they floated there uh, every month, waiting to pick up those coming out of occupied France. All the Americans have been shot down over Paris, coming across to Brittany to be collected. And the bravery and the courage and the resilience of that generation who died, so many of them, that we should be free. It seems to me that uh, Roy got it so right that that is one of the great uh, values that I suspect we need to, to build in our young people. Digby Jones says that Bronze Road gave him a sense of capable confidence and a feeling of being fortunate and thus always determined to help others less fortunate. Charles Grayson, as a parent, says the sheer breadth of opportunity in everything at Bronze, Bronze Road pursued with the same aspiration to the highest standard, whether that be drama or music or French or classics or science, pursued with the same aspiration to the highest of standards. And Patrick Fermigan, as a parent, says, there can be no doubt that Bronze Grove maximizes the potential of our children educationally and as individuals. If only everybody had the same opportunity. And that's the challenge about education, is that it's one shot through. I was talking to a parent tonight who said, our youngest is so happy at Bronze Grove, I just wish we'd put the other two through as well. Now, not every child's the same, you pick up school for a child, of course. So actually, I said reassuringly, in fact, one of the most maddening things that the junior crew is that if you put the whole family through, the older crew spend their entire lives saying, it isn't like that at all, you're completely wrong. I can tell you he's an absolute maniac, don't believe a word of it. So actually young, get rather crushed. So sometimes it's not a bad thing to move them about in my experience. But if only everybody had the same opportunity. Now I've chosen those quotes from many of the quotes, and I suppose they sum up some of the reasons why although the head doesn't believe in league tables, Talk to him about this later. Uh, you're in the top ten of the most achieving schools in the independent sector in the country. And therefore I thought I'd just reflect a little bit on what it would take to give so many more that sort of opportunity. It obviously all can't be a bronze grove, but what could we do if we raise our eyes? Now rewind yourself, think back onto your educational experience 
and for some of the great winners of the ACA Prize sitting in the front row, uh, it's your present experience. I was thinking about mine. I went to a church primary where the uh, teacher I remember most was called Miss Walker. She was, in fact, a religious maniac, I now realize. <laughs> uh, because it never, I never understood why she dressed in purple for the period sort of before Easter. And then she appeared to be in red for the period before Christmas. And then much of the year she was in green, because obviously that was Trinity. And it went on for months. Uh, she was the most extraordinary character, but from her, I learned an absolutely clear leadership message about the importance of accountability and the importance of working in teams. In her class, every individual in that class had an accountability. You were accountable for milk straws, you were accountable for changing the weather chart, you were accountable for leading the charge who stood up when the headmistress came in. You were all accountable for something. And you worked all the time in teams. The whole class was organised into little pink pigs, little red hens, little yellow ducks. And we celebrated the performance and the achievement of teams. And we recognised what people did to work in teams. I was seven, but it never left me. And then I went on to Camden School for Girls, 